2 Samuel, actually, is where we're at. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And in chapter, we're preaching through the Bible. I want to welcome all the visitors here today. I'm going to try to get geared up. I'm going to try to get this thing put in gear, and I'm going to let the clutch out on it here in just a minute, okay? And uh, we'll get rolling here in just a minute. Take me just a little bit. Now, I want you to hold 2 Samuel chapter 6. Then I want you to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 13. Hold that. All right? 1 Chronicles chapter 13. And hold that. And while you're holding those two with two fingers, I want you to go to the New Testament. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Or let's go to Romans chapter 15 first. I do this frequently, but to remind you that uh, proper and correct preaching of the Word of God preaches the whole counsel of God. And uh, when you're preaching out of the Old Testament, you should go to the New Testament for reference. And when you go preaching out of the New Testament, you should go back to the Old Testament for reference and let each build upon the other and each confirm the other. But in Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4, how many is there yet? Say amen. How many says, wait? We're waiting. And while we're waiting, the rest of you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All right, so you got four fingers stuck in your Bible now. 2 Samuel chapter 6, 1 Chronicles 13, Romans chapter 15, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'll let you lose two of the fingers in just a little bit. Now how many is in Romans 15? Okay. In verse 4 it says this. You ought to mark this verse in your Bible as many others along the way, but it's a very important verse of Scripture for your Christian growth and, uh, in, and your, your experience in Christ. Verse number four. For whatsoever things are written, when? A four time. When is that? That's the Old Testament writings. Whatsoever things are written a four time were written for what? For our learning. God wants you and I to learn some things from the Old Testament, from the lives of those people and from His Word. That we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have what? If you want hope, God says you go back to the lives and the stories and the accounts that I've written and the law that I've given in the Old Testament, and as you study those and learn from those, it will give you hope. That's what the Bible says. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You can let your finger out of the Romans there. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. It has given an example down through chapter 10 of the Old Testament, of the Israeli people in the Old Testament. In verse number 11 it says this, now, all these things happened unto them for what? In examples. And they are written for what? Our admonition. God just didn't put them over there to give you something to read. God said, I gave them for you for your admonition and upon whom the ends of the world are come. He said, there's a purpose, there's a reason, there's benefit, there's value to the lives and stories of these people in the Old Testament. Now, we've been going through the life of David as we're preaching through Second Samuel. And we want to read this morning. Uh, now, what I'm going to tell you is this. First and Second Samuel, look up here for just a minute, and First and Second Chronicles are corresponding books in the Bible. They give often, sometimes almost exactly the same account of stories, sometimes with a different angle or include little tidbits of information that just puts an entirely different understanding and, and, uh, and, and revelation on it. And so when you're reading through one, you really kind of need to be reading through both of them chronologically and reading both, 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 both perspectives of the story in Samuel, in Kings, and in Chronicles. All right? It runs like this together, each from a different perspective. We're going to read the story that is given in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. We're going to read that story in 1 Chronicles chapter 13. Am I got everybody confused by now? All right, I don't mean to. So what, what I'm doing now, I'm jumping up to First Chronicles 13, and uh, I'm going to read it, but it's the same account that we were going through Second Samuel in. But there's a reason because of the angle of the perspective that the story gives. Now, one more thing, just hold your First Chronicles 13, go back to First Samuel chapter 6, all right, to set the stage for this message. Now, I'm telling you something, God's given me a message this week. I mean, straight from the Bible, straight from the throne room. I'm telling you something. I thought last week's was the most important, but it wasn't. This and this. Amen. All right. In First Samuel chapter 6, there's a story that occurs. Israel and the Philistines are at war against each other. Israel and its spiritual leadership is in a backslidden condition with Eli and his sons and all that mess. 
They go out to war. They're not doing very good. So they come back and get the Ark of the Covenant, which is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, an earthly picture of the tabernacle which is in heaven. And they bring it out into battle with them, thinking that if they get their religious relics, and remember, remember me preaching on that, that they can have victory. God is not interested in ritualism and relics. God wants a reality in your life of Christ. And you, and one of the most devastating things that'll ever happen to you is thinking that God's going to bless you when He's not, just when you want Him for your spare tire in life. And whenever your religion becomes a relic and a ritual to you rather than a reality of Jesus Christ. So they take the ark out, and the ark is, they're defeated, and the ark is captured. Believe it or not, the ark of the covenant is captured by the Philistines. Now, when you get into chapter 6 and verse number 7, what you find out is that the ark of the covenant in the presence of the Philistines gave them nothing but trouble. The world does not like God. The world hates the Jesus said, no marvel, the world hates you. They hated me before they hated you. Don't get shocked that the world, don't get shocked that Dan Rather, and, well, he's gone. Praise God. Don't get shocked that all the news media hate the name of Jesus Christ. They don't want anybody to speak. They hate it. Now, the Philistines had all kinds of trouble hit them because of the presence of the ark in their midst. So they finally come to the decision, we've got to get this thing back to the Israeli people. And so what they, they didn't, they never had any instruction how to handle the ark. So in verse number 7, it says what they did. Verse number 7, now therefore make a what? A new cart. Now I've got an old message on this very subject, preached probably 10 or 15 years ago on a new cart. And I'm not preaching that this morning, I'll mention a little bit about it. But they, they, they get a new cart and they hook up two milk cows that they wean the calves off of and sent the ark back to the Jewish people with this new cart. All right? Now remember that that's what the world did with the Ark of the Covenant. With, with, and the Ark of the Covenant is the picture of Christ. Now, let's go back up now to Second Samuel chapter, or First Chronicles chapter 13. And when we get there, now that, uh, that Ark came back to the children of Israel. It, uh, it stayed in a man's house for about 70 to 100 years. And then we're, uh, we're in this situation now where, uh, David is becoming king of all Israel now. All 12 tribes. And he wants to bring the ark up to Jerusalem and make it the centerpiece of the nation. So here we go reading chapter 13 of First Chronicles. And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all the land of Israel, with them also to the priests and Levites, which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. And let us, well here it is, now pay attention, let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And all the congregation said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Watch that real careful, that little statement, this, this thing was right in all the eyes of the people. So David gathered all Israel together from Shihor of Egypt, even in the end of Hamath, to bring the ark of God from Kerjeth Jerem. And David went up, and all Israel, to Baal at Bala, that is, to Kerjeth Jerem, which belongeth to Judah, to bring up thence the ark of God the Lord, that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. Now watch verse 7 real carefully. And they carried the ark of God in a new cart, out of the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ohio drave the cart. So here they are going up the road in a brand new cart. They said they, they were sent down to the cart, cart, cart dealership, said send us a, up a brand new Oldsmobile cart, anyway. They bring up this cart, they hook on uh, some oxen, and, and these two guys, boy, they're sitting up there in the seat of the cart, and they're up there just, boy, I mean, they're big time, and Ark of Covenant's in the back, and here they go. Carried the Ark, that got a new cart out of the house, but it doesn't know how to drive the cart. Watch verse number eight. Man, I mean, revival breaks out, amen, glory to God, hallelujah, we're going to have us a big time. David and all Israel played before God with all their might, with singing, with harp, sultry, timbrels, cymbals, and trumpets. And they came into the threshing for a child, and and when they came into the threshing floor, child, and Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen did something. What did they do? Now, it's real important. There's three things there. One is that he put his hand uh, upon the ark. Second thing was there's oxen pulling it. Third thing, they stumbled. Watch verse 10. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark. Therefore, he died before God. Watch verse 11, real careful. David was displeased because God had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, that place is called Perez-Uzzah to this day. 
And David was afraid of God that day. He said, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? That's my text, what I'm preaching on today. Underline that in your Bible. I'm under preaching on the subject of how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? Verse number 13, so David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Let's pray, Lord, help us to preach today in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. The Ark of the Covenant, I want to talk, let's review ourselves about the Ark of the Covenant just a little while this morning. The Ark of the Covenant was a, pitch, it was a piece of furniture that God commanded Moses to build when he built the tabernacle. The Ark of the Covenant was the center in the Holy of Holies, and it had, it was made out of a kaya wood or shittim wood. It was overlaid with gold, and on top it had what's called the mercy seat, which was made out of pure, pure gold. It had cherubims on each end of it that pointed in toward each other. And inside that ark, now you had the, you had the, you had the, the tabernacle space, and then you had the tabernacle proper, and then you had the holy place, and inside there was a perfectly squared cube building that was the Holy of Holies. And in it was the Ark of the Covenant, and in that Ark of the Covenant, it said it was made out of the K of wood, which speaks of Jesus' humanity, covered with pure gold, which speaks of his deity. The mercy seat that was on, that was the lid of it was made of pure gold, which Pray for me right now. I need real help. I'm having satanic battle. I mean, my, it's, it's sickening. Lord, I just pray right now. Help me. I, Lord, I need help. And God, I know the devil. He's doing everything he can to divert, divert my attention from preaching the word of God that you give me to distractions that are in this building right now. Distractions so subtle, so sorry, so low down, it's pitiful. God, I just pray right now that you rebuke that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that you'll give liberty for me to preach today in Jesus' name. Lord, you know we need this message. God, I pray that you remove the hindrances from this church, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That, that, um, that ark was sitting there in the midst, and that mercy was pure gold, which means that mercy is purely of God. And then what, uh, what they did, they, inside that box, it's just, it's just about two, uh, four foot long, about two foot wide, two foot high, approximately right in there. And there were three things that God told Moses to put inside of it. One of it was, was the law. And that's the picture of Jesus Christ. The law was put inside the commandments that God gave Moses so that we know that Jesus, he kept the commandments. All right? Then there was a pot of manna that was inside the ark, and that is represented that Jesus Christ is the bread of life, and he is the sustenance of your life. The third thing that was in the ark was the, the Aaron's rod that budded. Now, that rod had been cut off, and then later on it budded, even though it was separated from the source of its life. That speaks of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ that he gives to you and I. And not only that he rose from the dead, but that he'll raise us in resurrection power. And it blew. So you have these aspects. And this whole thing spoke of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. In fact, Noah's Ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. The Ark of the Covenant is a picture of Jesus Christ. And Moses' Ark that his mother laid him in the Nile River is a picture of Jesus Christ. It's a place of refuge, a place of safety, and a place of salvation. Now, the tabernacle is a picture of Christ, it's a picture of the church, united with Christ, and it's also, watch this, listen carefully, a picture of acceptable and proper worship and walk with God. Now, this uh, Ark of the Covenant was a centerpiece in that Holy of Holies. Now, here's what happened. Outside, they brought their lambs. The lambs, the priest would put his, the father that brought the lamb in would put his hand on the head of the lamb. He would lean upon it. In other words, that the lamb was bearing his sin. Then the priest would reach the knife and take a basin and slit the lamb's throat. And the blood of the lamb would go into a little basin, a bowl. And then at the great, at the day of atonement, on the day of atonement once a year, the blood from that lamb offered for the sins of the people was taken in and behind the veil into the Holy of Holies. And the priest would take the blood, sprinkle it on the mercy seat of the tabernacle, Go back out, and what that tabernacle was a picture of, that the, the mercy of God could be, and forgiveness of sin could be extended to the people through the offering and through the sacrifice and through the substitution of an innocent substitute. It was a picture, it was the gospel. It was the gospel that Christ died for sinners in their place, and that a holy God could forgive their sins through the blood sacrifice of an innocent substitute. And that's the gospel. 
Now that ark was precious because when you blew it away, it, when you did away with it and didn't uh, honor and revere what it stood for, you, you obscured and marred and messed up the whole gospel's message and the whole gospel's picture. Now David is now, as I said while it was raining, over the entire country. He's gathered all 12 tribes together. Saul is dead and they're gathered together. Now we're going to divert for just a minute. In second, uh, first Chronicles, I want you to go back to t- chapter 11. And I'm going to put, pick up some points of interest, and then we're going to take off on this thing and run fast. In First Chronicles chapter 11, you see there in verse number 1 that all Israel, that's all 12 tribes, are gathered themselves together to David in Hebron and so forth. In verse number 3 it says, David was king over Israel. Now, in this chapter, chapter 11, when you get to the first few verses through verse 3, is how David became king over all Israel. From verses 4 through 9... He now makes, watch this, he now makes Jerusalem the capital of Israel. And in verse number 10 through the rest of the chapter nearly, he lists mighty men of God that God brought into his life, that God brought into the kingdom to help him in, the, in what God had called him to do in life. And so, uh, so you have this mighty men recording there. Now in chapter 12, and I want all you young men to think you're tough to pay attention here. Because he's going to describe some of these mighty men to you. Uh, and what they were like. In chapter 12, it says, These are they which came to David at Ziklag while he kept himself close because of Saul's son's kiss. And they were among the mighty men. Watch this. God says a mighty man is a helper of the war. Now tonight we're going to talk about a new ministry called David's Mighty Men. And I just want you, I'm giving you this just kind of as a prerequisite tonight. Verse number 2 says, They were armed with both. Mighty men of God ought to be armed with the weapons of God's warfare. And they could use both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of the bow. In other words, it didn't matter whether they were shooting right-handed or left-handed. These guys were good at what they did. Well, you go down to verse number 8. Look, watch these guys. It said, Into the Gadites they're separated unto David in the hold in the wilderness, men of might, men of war, fit for the battle, that could handle shield and buckler. Watch this. Whose faces were like the faces of lions and were swift as the rows upon the mountains. You say, Reggie, what do you get out of that? I get out of that that these mighty men that God had raised up uh, to establish a kingdom for God, these men had faces of lions. They were not afraid of people. Now, I want to tell you something. What's keeping the gospel and the power of God out of this country, and that is the fear of man. If fear of man brings a snare, and God says, if you raise up a generation of young men and men who are, have faces like lions who are not afraid to stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ and for the word of God, you'll see something happen. It tells me not only were they not afraid, but they were confident in the Lord. They were courageous in Christ. No, they had, they had, they, they were able to face the situation. In other words, a lion's face, he'll raise up and he will face the situation. He'll look at it. He's not afraid to face the things that are facing him. Hey, no, and that said they were like rows upon the mountains. That means they were in shape. Hey, they were in spiritual shape. They, they weren't, they had lagged behind in prayer and Bible reading and meditation and their walk with God. They were in shape and ready to go for God. And then you get down into verse number 22. It said at that time, day by day, there came to David to help him until it was a great host, like the host of God. And you get into verse number 30, and the children of Ephraim, 20,800 mighty men of what? Valor. Fav- famous throughout the house of their fathers. I'm going to tell you something, we need some mighty men of valor. Some men who are famous in the household of their fathers for standing for God. In verse number 32, and the children of Issachar, and boy, this is a big one. It said, which were men that had under, mark this verse in your Bible. Men that had understandings of the time to know what Israel ought to do. That's what America needs right now. We need some men that understand the times and know what desperate situ- uh, what it calls the, the desperate measures that need to be taken. They know what to do. Look down in verse number 33 of Zebulon, which such as went forth to battle, experts in war with all instruments of war, 50,000, and what's this phrase? Which could would do what? Keep rank. keep rank. They could keep rank. That is so important in seeing the work of God done. And then not the next thing. They were not as something. What? They were not a double heart. They didn't talk out one side of their mouth about, about loving God and serving God, but their whole life living portrayed another thing. They were men of a single heart. They were not of a double heart. Look at verse number 38. Some other men that God brought into David. Of the, all these men of war that could keep rank. They were men of war. They could keep rank. They weren't trying to get ahead of each other. They, they knew that they needed to stay united. You know something? If we can just get the men of God united in this country and get them in rank, there's not a force in hell that could stop this thing. 
No, I bet, but it said they had a perfect, it came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest also of David, Israel were of one heart to make David king. You know what I thought to myself? Glory to God, if we had a bunch of men in this nation who were of one heart and of one mind and of one rank to make Jesus Christ king of this nation, wouldn't we have something? I'll tell you what, God brought some people around David there. Look at the last phrase in that chapter at the bottom of verse number 40. There was joy in Israel. Now, I'm telling you something. There's a formula for success in the work of God. Now, these men were strong. They were loyal. They were dedicated. They were united. They were wise. They understood the times. They knew what they ought to do. They were single-hearted, and they lived and labored in joy. I pray God will give us some of that. Now, I'm going to put point a couple things out for you. In chapter 13 of 1 Chronicles, does anybody know what the number 13 means in Bible? Rebellion. So you know what? We just read that chapter 13, and we're going to find out that even though David and these mighty men wanted to do something right for God, they were doing it in the wrong way, and they were doing it in rebellion. And to know that, but what chapter is this, record, this story recorded in 2 Samuel? Does anybody know? Remember? 2 Samuel chapter 6. 6 is the number of man. You know what that tells me? They were trying to do the work of the Lord in the ways of men, and God called it rebellion. Now, I'm going to tell you why a lot of ministries and a lot of churches are dead as last year's corn chuck, and why they're not worth a nickel to the work of God, and they're just, and they're just clipping along, getting nothing done. I'm going to show you something this morning. Now, so we've got a rebellion in number, chapter in Chronicles, a man's number in chapter 6. David wants to do a good and honorable thing. Namely, it's this. Give the Ark of the Covenant back into the center of the nation's life and worship. Now, he wants to do a right thing. David said that Ark of the Covenant is down there being held back in a guy's house. He said, that thing ought to be for the whole nation. He said, I'd like to bring Christ. Now watch this. I'd like to bring the Ark of the Covenant, which is a picture of Christ for you and I, back up into the center of life and culture and society. Boy, wouldn't it be great to have a president or a leader who wants to put Christ at the heart of our nation? To put Christ at the... Wouldn't it be great to have men in this church who want Christ at the center of their own lives? at the center of their homes, at the center of their families, at the center of their businesses, at the center of our government, Christ at the center of our courts, Christ at the center of our schools, Christ at the center, yea, even of our churches. David tries to do a right thing in the wrong way, and he is living by what you and I have inundated with in our generation, that is, that the end justifies the means. That's what the world calls this. The world says, well, just as long as your motives are good or as long as you're sincere and you mean well, it doesn't matter how you serve God. That's a lie. That's rebellion. That's disobedience. That'll get you in trouble with God. They, this nation at this point, this is what, when I begin to say this thing and really realize the ramifications of it, really read it, took it for what it said, they are so far removed from the Word of God, even though they want to serve God, that not only David, but the priests, the men of war, the mighty men, the whole nation was so far removed from this book, it wasn't even funny. They were trying to live for God, not reading and abiding by the Word of God. They were so far removed from the Word of God, running their own, and running on their own ideas, that what should have been a triumph turned out to be a tragedy. What should have been a revival turned out to be their ruin. In 1 Corinthians, 1 Chronicles chapter 13, if you're right there in verse number 1, the Bible said that David consulted with the people. But you know, it never did say that he went back and read the Old Testament. He never went back and read the books of the law to find out what to do. When it comes to handling the ark of God, said he went out and talked to a bunch of guys. Now I'm going to tell you something. I love all you guys. I appreciate you, but you know something? I'm not going to come around and ask your opinion about everything. I appreciate it. I may put value in it. I may put a certain amount of estimated weight on it, but I'm going to take your opinion and my opinion, and I'm going to go back and check it against what the Word of God says. That's how this church ought to be ran, is according to the Word of God, not by... Cons That's why I don't like boards. I don't like committees. I don't like organizations, because usually they start running on men's ideas and man's imagination, and they get away from the Word of God, and then they wonder why God don't bless it. Well, he said he consulted with them. And look at verse number four, what happened? Hey, verse number four, boy, the congregation, all the congregation said they'd do so. For the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. The problem was, even though it was right in the eyes of the people, it was not right in the eyes of God. Now, they, they wanted to bring the ark back. They wanted to put, well, listen to me, we got a lot of churches, a lot of religion in America. 
Got a lot of, quote, Christ-carrying and Christ-honoring religion. And yet it seems like this nation is going to hell in a handbasket. It just seems like the sludge of sin is just flowing down the creek and nobody can stop it. I'm going to tell you why it is. Because we're trying to do God's work. We're trying to carry Christ and the gospel of Christ to a lost and dying world in a manner that the Bible does not teach to do so. And God cannot violate His word. That's a trick of the devil. Now, whatever, being right in the eyes of all the people doesn't make it right. We ought to ask ourselves, what does the Bible say about this issue? In verse number 7 of chapter 13, the Bible tells us they carried the ark of God in a new cart. Well, where'd they get that idea from? From the world. They didn't get that from the Bible. If they'd have read their Bibles, they would have known better than to do that. But they said, well, you know, we watched the Philistines ship this ark of covenant. That was a pretty neat idea. Let the oxen do the work. Let the wagon carry the load. That sure looks good to us. I mean, what would be wrong with laying a new cart? I mean, it is a new cart. We didn't go get an old used one. And we put Christ on that and let that cart, let that new cart carry. Now, look in verse number 7, they put that. And then verse number 8, I mean, the revival meeting is on. I'm telling you, the revival meeting is on. Benny Hinn's up there. And all the rest of that satanic crowd. They've got, um, well, look at it. Look, wouldn't you like to be in this church service? Here's David and all Israel played before God with all their might. Woo! Boy, I mean, they were getting with it. They were running up down the aisles. They were dancing. They were having themselves a big time. He said they were singing. Boy, they were singing with all their might. Hallelujah. Boy, I mean, they were getting with it. He said they had the heart. Bang, bang, bang. They were playing the piano. And I mean, here they go. Then it said they had psalteries and timbrels and cymbals and the band and the orchestra was up there in that great church and wham, the cymbals would hit. And the trumpets would blow. Boy, I mean, they were having church, weren't they? Having church, weren't they? No, they weren't. They just having a commotion. And I'm going to tell you, most of what you watch on TV ain't nothing but a commotion. Most of what you see perpetrated in this country right now is church and exalting Jesus Christ is nothing but a, but a bunch of humanistic rebates against God's commotion and the Holy Ghost. It's nothing but a substitute of the power and work of the Holy Spirit of God. Verse number seven. I mean, they was having a big time. There was revival. There was excitement. Let me tell you something. Just because things get exciting does not mean God's in it. I've been in fist fights that were exciting and God wasn't within a mile of it. Amen. <laughs> Just because something's exciting doesn't mean God's in it. Now watch verse number 9. When they came to the threshing floor of Ch- 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 Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark. For the oxen stumbled. Now I'm going to give you something if you want to do some Bible study this week. Blow your mind, I mean, blow your head off and your socks straight in the creek. Amen. I mean, this is one of the wildest studies there is in the Bible. I don't know everything about it, but it's in there. I know some about it. But it's about the missing cherub. When you study the subject of cherubs, cherubs what God put in the, in the Garden of Eden with flaming swords to keep man out of the Garden of Eden. You read in the book of Revelation that cherubs are before Almighty God. They've got their wings spread out before Him and they're crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Night and day, they never stop. Cherubs were on the Ark of the Covenant, facing each other, their wings spread out and their heads bowed down in reverence and worship and praise. Oxen were pulling this cart. And the, in Ezekiel chapter 1, there's, there's an eagle, a man, face of a man, face of an ox, and the face of a calf. And when you get into Ezekiel chapter 28, it leaves out the face of the calf. Let me tell you something. There is something to it, these pictorial depictions of the devil with horns and hooves. In Exodus chapter 32, whenever Moses up on the mount came back down, they had taken their earrings and made a golden calf. The fact that it's oxen pulling this thing tells me something. The devil was pulling the new cart that was claiming to pull Christ into their midst. It's one of the greatest deception stories in the Bible. It tells how easily people can be deceived thinking that God is in something when God is being pulled by the devil. I'm going to tell you something. The charismatic movement that was in this country was being pulled by the devil claiming to pull Christ through this country. Anything that perpetrates worldliness and nakedness and banging around and doesn't, doesn't preach against sin is being, I want to tell you what you can tell. Let me tell you what you can tell. You got a new cart pull, trying to pull a quote Christ into the camp. And that is when they will not preach against sin that Christ died for. Amen. When they, listen to me, this world is so full of Christ died for them, they don't know what he died for. 
Because nobody in this country is preaching against sin to make them understand the transgression of the law anymore. Now listen to me, this, and I'm not going to go on that, but there's a missing cherub, and it's the devil. Now this new cart, that was the Philistines' way of doing things. The world, that was the world's way. They were con clearly contrary to God's word about it. You say, Reggie, what are you talking about? In our generation, we've got a whole slug of new carts coming up the road in Christianity. We've got, there, and what they're trying to do is carry Christ and a salvation. And Paul warned about another Christ and another gospel. They're trying to carry Christ and salvation to the world in a new cart. I say to you that this is the curse of modern day Christianity. We've got a new cart Bible. New cart Bible. You go into a bookstore now try to buy a Bible. They almost scoff and laugh at you if you want to know authorized version, King James Bible. They're selling Bibles by the droves, all kinds of brands. I'm going to tell you something. It is killing this country. If you want to know why the glory of God is going off of America, it's because America forsook the book that made it the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And when you get involved in those Bibles, you're messing with a new cart Bible. And let me remind you who's pulling the cart. Satan is pulling the cart of the new Bible. We've got new cart music in our churches. Music that at, that at one time in our churches knew, absolutely knew without question was an abomination before Almighty God. Somebody told me this week about being in church and said there's some pretty decent songs, but he said they just sing them over and over and over and over and over and over. And they don't sing the old hymns of the faith. What's wrong with there is a fountain filled with blood thrown from Emmanuel Zane? What's wrong with amazing grace? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Did you know something that if you've got the Spirit of God in you, them songs will never get old to you. You'll never get tired of them. They'll get sweeter. They'll get richer. They'll bless your heart more when you're 70 than they will, didn't they, at 25? Amen. Amen. The things of God never grow old. Amen. They're eternal. I'm saying you've got new cart music. I mean, they brought in all kinds of stuff. You never notice I don't have these bands coming here. Bang, bang, bang. I ain't having it. If you want to go somewhere else, it's not coming in. The devil's not bringing his oxen in here pulling the new cart of music in this church. That's why I want everybody to ask what you're going to sing. You run it by me first. That don't mean I don't like you. I'm just checking. All right? Then there's new cart moral. It used to be shacking up. Fornication and adultery was wrong and wicked. And nowadays, nobody wants to preach on it. And if you preach on it, they act like you're legal. If I ever heard anything like it in my life. If I couldn't come up with a better argument than that, but preaching against sin, I'd quit. Preach against the, the, the new cart morals. Now you can live like a dog and a hog. Have common law marriages. New cart, I'm telling you. Christ ain't in that stuff. Then there's new cart standards. Preachers walking behind the pulpit with Bermuda shorts on, flip-flops on their shoes and earrings on their toes. Worldly, seeker-sensitive churches where they're supposed to come in and make the sinner feel comfortable. I want a sinner to feel loved. I want him to feel cherished by God. But I do not want him comfortable in this church. That's the most abominable thing you can do to a lost man, make him feel comfortable in this place. If you're here this morning, I'm here to tell you and not saved. You better get saved. You're going to burn in hell. God's wrath is against you right now. You're one heartbeat away from the fires of hell and screaming forever. You ought to be uncomfortable. God have mercy on churches that make sinners feel comfortable. New, new cart churches. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Coffee shops. Donut stores. Social centers. Then there's new cart preaching. Soft and smooth. Sweet and silky. Stroke my back while I sin. Stay silent about issues that matter. Make everybody feel good. New cart teaching. Nothing but a bunch of psychology masquerading as religion. Then there's new cart leadership in the church in America. Women preachers. It is absolutely against the Bible for women to pastor a church and preach. You, you say you don't like that? You're just, don't, don't get mad at me. You get mad at God. You look up at God and start cussing Him now. That's the truth. Bishop must be the husband of one wife. Well, what are you then? A lesbian married to another woman and pretending to be a husband? New leadership, queer. Let me tell you something about multi-marriage. Amen. Hey, listen, you ain't got no business pastor if you've been married more than one woman. Unless she's died. Unless your first wife died. Listen, why don't we give back? You say, well, why God ain't blessing it? Let me tell you what happened. This is what happened. God ain't in it, so they have to start humanizing and putting the human effort to it. And so they start substituting the power of God 
with humanistic efforts. That's why the music gets louder and the deal gets on and on and it's more and more and more and bringing in this and bringing in that to entertain the folks. I want to tell you something. I, you know something just gets my goat. Walk, drive by a church that says, Pastors, Mr. and Mrs. Red Skelly. I want to tell you something about that little woman right there. She's a sweet little gal, but she ain't the pastor of this church, and she's not the co-pastor of this church. Some of you ought to shout right there and ought to be glad, amen. I don't care. Listen, I've been here a long time. They don't mean beans if I just got here yesterday. But if you think I'm going to back up on this stuff, you're crazy in the bed bug. I'm going to preach this stuff. You all run me out with sticks. I'm, I'm, I'll get out there in the parking lot and preach it. Amen. If you come here to be smooth around, listen, I'll tell you what. You get right with God's Word and you'll have the Spirit of God on you and the joy of the Lord in you. It'll quit being hypocrisy and put on. you find the real thing. It'll get good in your soul. Amen. Then there's a new cart motive. You need this three-disc set. How to save your marriage and finances. Every family needs four of them. Buy them for your cousins. These 32 cent CDs sell for only $39 a piece. Now it's a gift. But you don't get it without the money. Never heard such a lying bunch of thieves in my life. The biggest thieves in the United States are on television every Sunday morning. If I get up, if I got up and did that at auctions, they'd hit it stone me to death for stealing off of them like that. Then there's new cart mode is money. Then there's new cart mission. Gotten to be the biggest bureaucracy in the world. Bureaucratic mission. I don't tell you, so I, I just long and I pray God to bust wide open the whole concept of missions in America. Till we get back to doing it God's way and the Bible way by faith and the power of God and obedience to God. Then there's new, there's new cart giving systems, twisting and hammering people to give. Twist, twist, but you know what? If I gotta get up here and preach on you folks to give, that's the biggest joke in the world. I ain't wasting three. I might teach you what the Bible has to say about giving. But if you think I'm going to get up here and twist your arm and jump on you every week about giving, your money wouldn't be worth a dime to God's business if you gave it under due rest. Amen? If you don't give cheerfully, I'm going to tell you something. If it's not motivated by the Spirit of God and motivated by the love, if you've got to be propped up, pumped, and hammered on by a preacher to give, that's stupid. Don't give. Amen? Now, notice verse 9. It said that the oxen, plural, they stumble. Do you know what a new cart ministry will do and a new cart church will do that's pulled by the devil? It's a stumble. And you know what a stumbling stone is in the Bible? It causes people to fall. And a new cart Christianity is a stumbling stone, a rock of the fifth. It'll, cut, it'll cause people to fall. It'll cause folks to stumble and fall into hell. Now watch this real careful. I'll show you the proof of it. In verse number 9, the Bible said the oxen, they go along up here and the oxen eat and stumble. And when he stumbled, the ark shook, and as it was driving the ark, turns around, reaches, and touches the ark. He's going to make sure it don't fall off. You know what that is? That's a picture of propping up the work of God with human effort. Propping up a ministry through human effort. I'm going to tell you something this morning. God does not need you and I to prop his work up. You know what makes this place go? Because God runs it. And I don't try to prop it up with Reggie's hand. You know what? God has a perfect right to shut this thing down at 1 o'clock this afternoon. It's him. And the worst mistake you can ever make is try to have a ministry that you've got to keep propped up. Now, you listen to me real good. I'm talking about a propped up by man revival work of God will go nowhere in the work of God. It'll kill people. If we have to go around propping up the work of God, God ain't in it. That's just the facts of it. And I say to you that when people beg you and plead you for their money, if you don't sin, this is a low month, we're having a hard time, you need to sin. I thought God owned the earth and the world and the universe and everything in it. You reckon God take care of his business? You bet he is. God doesn't need you and I to prop up his work, amen? He wants us to carry Christ to the world, but not propped up by man's effort and strength. And I could preach on that for a week. This is what makes the difference in this work right here. It's God, not me, not you. You're not propping up God's work here. I'm not, I, I, I hate this, but if you left here, God would still run this place without your tithe and offering. Oh, I see people. I, I, I go preach these revivals. You can just see some of these people that's in their faces. Well, if I left here, it all fall apart. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. God don't need you 
He'll use you if you'll let him, but he don't have to have you to do his work. Wasn't it Mueller that said, God's work done in God's way will not lack God's provision nor power. That's why we don't have garbage sales here. I don't want nobody's house to have a sign out in front of it with your old used shoes that you wouldn't give a dime for anyway. Saying, garage sale, going, fun, all proceeds go to Liberty Faith. Don't you do that, I'll take a shotgun and shoot that sign down out of your yard. That's not how God said to support His work. You don't bake cookies down at Walmart and say, going to Liberty Faith Christian McCaddy, I don't want your box tops, I don't want your junk. Get that stuff out of here! You listening to me? I love you. But this place has always been run by God's way. And I don't tend to have none of that. Don't be garage sailing. You're going, you're going to have garage sale? Have one. Have a big one. Have a good one. But do it personally. And then bring your tithes and offerings to God. If that's what you want to do, you do. Don't you put it in the name of the church. Don't you put it in the name of school. Don't you be doing anything. To, no, no fundraisers in this place. None. Zero. Zip. Auto. Okay? You say, why? Because I don't want the devil leading this thing. I want it done God's way so God can bless it. I want God to get the glory. I don't want to get around and say, boy, you know, I really sacrificed. Me and Karen pulled out old closets, old clothes stuff, boy, I said, raised $32.75, so kept the church going. <laughs> Mercy sakes alive. Now, I want to tell you something. We think that, that God's not real serious about this, but not so. As it turned around, touched that ark, bam, God killed him. Killed him. Great God dead, killed him. And we, David got mad about it. I'll get to that in just a minute. Why did God kill Uzzah? Because he violated, listen to me, he violated the word of God. Let me, let me just go back and say something about this church and this work here. There is no way on God's green earth that people like you and I could be supporting this church, this ministry, the school here, the CD ministry, the mission works that we do. By the way, Christy, we do 15% now from the church on missions. 15% of what this church brings in goes straight out to missions. I mean, that's just right off the top. We don't charge tuition at this school. You show me. I'm going to tell you something. Years ago, God told me, said, don't charge tuition. I tried it one time. It did nothing but made a mess. Let me tell you how it made a mess. People send their kids into school. You send them a billing. They wouldn't pay. Then they wouldn't pay they, in order, so they, they felt bad, so they had to figure out, jive up reasons why to get mad at the staff and all the supervisors and monitors. They had to have a jive in reason so the next time they met you, they wouldn't wave or they acted cold. You see, if you don't pay people, if people ain't paying, they just dealing with God. Just dealing with God. The other thing about it is, every week of my life, I've got, really to be honest with you, I've got to only worry about it because I know it's God's work, God's going to take care of it. But every week of my life, I watch a miracle here as God provides the funds to provide every need this school has, staff, I mean, the whole nine yards, and does it right through this local church here. No garage sales, no fundraisers, no tuition. It's a miracle every week. You go, I wish the government would try it. Yeah. It can be done, amen. It can be done by the power and the provision of God done in obedience to the Word of God. Now, what was the problem? Write these scriptures down. I'm not going to take time to run there and read them to you this morning. Just write them down go home and study it up yourself. Numbers chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. The ark, when it was carried, was to be carried covered. And there's a whole message and ministry to what God told them to how He told them to cover it. All right? So that was the first thing. They weren't doing that. They was to be carried with coverings on it. Now, and even the colors had importance in it. In Numbers chapter 7, verse 9, the ark was to be carried on the shoulders of the Kohathites. They are a separated, appointed, chosen persons to carry the ark of the covenant. Listen to me. God still calls. God still separates. God still anoints. God still appoints preachers and individuals to preach the Word of God and to carry the Ark of the Covenant. You believe that or not? They were to carry it on their shoulders. Oh man, this was good. Remember when we talked about keep rank? There were four of them. And they ran a stave through the four rings. They ran two staves. They ran a stave on each side, two rings on each side, run a stave through it. Two rings on the other side, run a stave through it, and two men in front, two men in back, put it on their shoulders, and they walked in lockstep together. The Bible said, how beautiful it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity, carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Do you know why a thousand homes around Norwood, Rock County, are not in church this morning? It's because people who profess to be carrying Christ can't even get along with each other. That's exactly right. Who wants to go to church where they're having blow-ups and blow-outs all the time, fire strife all the time? Who wants to get involved in that stuff? They were, by the way, there was four of them. Four represents the number of the world. They were to carry the ark, the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel message to the world in unity. They were preserving the holiness of God. But the big issue right here was in Numbers 4.15. That, by the way, Exodus 25.4. But in Numbers 4.15, write this one down. God said in Numbers 4.15 that anyone that touched the ark would die. You reach out, touch it, death. All right? Now here's the truth of this message this morning. Get this. I mean, get this. This will help you. God has given and commanded His Word, His instruction, and His penalty concerning the ark, which He had, which had to do with acceptable worship and service. There is a lot of worship and a lot of service going on in the name of Christ that God is not even accepting at all. You see, you can't even come to God except through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by His blood. There's an acceptable way to come to God. God said that if they don't do this instruction like I said, He said they'll die, anyone who touched it. Now listen to this, carefully. What would have happened had not God killed Uzzah at that moment? Can anybody tell me? Think. God would have been a liar. You listen to me right now. I'm telling you, you better get this. You never get nothing else in your life. There's a thousand things God says in that word, and he's not joking about it. God is not playing games with you. He's not playing mind games. He's not tinkering with your, with your intellect. When God says, don't do something, God means don't do it. If God had not killed Uzzah at that moment, God would have been a liar, and this whole book would be a joke. He would have violated his own character, his own word, his own nature, and he would not be God. And when God says it's appointed unto men wants to die and after this the judgment, do you reckon he'll keep his word? Amen. When God says that he's going to, you're going to give an account of every thought you've ever had, do you reckon he's going to keep your, his word? When God says that you're going to give an account of every word you've spoken, every thought you've thought, your attitudes, your motives in life, God says he's going to bring that into judgment. Do you think he's kidding or is he real about it? Amen. Yes, he's real about it. There's all kinds of principles. There's what's called cause and effect relationship. You do this, this is going to happen. It has to do with the holiness of God and how God guards His holiness. The fact that God retains and maintains His holiness at all costs and that His holiness is primarily has to do... Watch this. This is a new deal to me almost. You know when you ask most people, what does it mean to have about the holiness, being holy with God? Well, don't drink, don't smoke, don't, don't, don't do this. It's all the stuff I don't do. Not according to Scripture. According to Scripture, a holy walk with God has to... Honoring and obeying God's Word, His written Word. Listen to this. Now that will affect all those things that I mentioned. The holiness of life has to do with a heart that says, if that's what the Bible says, I'm going to live by it. I'm going to obey it. Hey, hey, hey. That's why you've got all across this country in churches, people walking up to you claiming to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Who are half dressed, look like Jezebel, lives are rotten, cheat, hook, cook, lie business, but go around the churches, come in there and whoop de doo, and I'm holy. It's just, a, just, a, it's nothing but a new cart carried by the devil under the masquerade of Christianity. When God says, it, "What's this? It is better to obey than to sacrifice." It doesn't matter about your giving if you're not obeying the Word of God. You're wasting your time and effort. Holiness has to do with keeping His Word. Now watch this. God said in the book of Psalms that He has placed His Word above His name. The Bible said in Romans, let God be true and every man a liar. God is not going to forfeit His Word. For in doing so, He would forfeit His holiness and His ability to be saved, to save us and we'd all be lost. I've often used this example that holiness of God is his greatest attribute, not his love. Many people disagree with that, but they've not thought it through. Does God love everyone? Yes. Yeah. Is everybody going to heaven? Why not? God loves them. 
because God is holy, sin has to be dealt with. And the only way it can be dealt with, and the only way he allows it to be dealt with, is through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. And he's not going to violate that to save you. In fact, he'll honor that to save you. In fact, if listen to me, dear friend, you die lost and God doesn't send you to hell, God's a liar. But God's not lying. God's going to keep his word about sin. God's going to keep his word about death. God's going to keep his word about hell and judgment. God's going to keep his word about salvation. He said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I don't care what you think. If they call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, God will keep his word. God will save you if you ask him to. God will keep his word about forgiveness. God will keep his word about redemption. God will keep his word about resurrection. Someday they are coming up out of the grave. God will keep his word about the second coming of Jesus Christ. He is coming back. God will keep his word about everything. God is holy. God is so holy that he destroyed the entire world population except eight people one time. God is so holy that he burned up Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. And by the way, if you study your Bible out, you'll find out where brimstone comes from. It comes from hell. And God literally, he said, you're of hell. You want hell? I'll give you hell. And God rained fire and brimstone on that city and destroyed them. God is so holy that Moses and Joshua had to take their shoes off at the burning bush. God is so holy, no one could touch Mount Sinai when he was given the law. God is so holy that whenever the Ark of the Covenant came before the image of Dagon, Dagon had to fall down his face. A stinking rock fell down before that Ark. And when they propped it back up, that shit, God cut his hands and his feet off and it fell down again. God is so holy. Some of you think I'm joking. You think I'm just up here braying like a mule. Well, that's all right. I'm going to tell you something, but God, with God's grace and God's mercy, I'm going to keep preaching this old book. If I can, I'm going to preach it harder. It's the truth, amen. God is so holy that God, listen to this, you can look it up in the Bible, that God killed 50,070 men at Beth Shemesh when they lifted up the lid and looked into the ark. Bam! God killed 50,070 men. You know why? There's a beautiful picture there. You can't look at the law. The law kill you. You can't get saved by the keeping of the law. The law kill you. It's ministers death. But Christ kept the law. And His mercy is what separates you from the wrath of the law. And it's Christ that saves you and Christ alone that saves you. God is so holy that in heaven right now, while you're sitting in your seat, right now there are cherubims and seraphims crying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. Right now. God is so holy that demons in the New Testament, when they saw Jesus Christ, they said, We know who art thou art, the Holy One of God. Even the devils know Jesus Christ is holy. God is so holy. Listen to this. Christ is so holy that he is able to bear the sin of the world on his own body on the tree. He is so holy that he was able to take the sin of the entire world on his own body on the tree and bear it for you and I. Every stinking, filthy, nasty thing you've ever done, Jesus Christ was so holy and is so holy he could take that sin upon him himself and redeem you and I through his sacrifice. You say, Reggie, what are you talking about this morning? I'm talking about that David and others have failed to realize and understand and reverence the holiness of God. Here's what's an amazing thing. Think with me. Let's go back over there. We're outside. We're down there from Jerusalem away. They're coming up through there and all of a sudden the oxen stumble and the ark shakes and Uzzah touches it and God kills him and the whole, the whole parade, the whole religious movement, the whole revival stops. And all of a sudden people are running away and say, oh my God, what happened to Uzzah? Why did that happen? Oh my land, what happened to Uzzah? God killed him. Crowds are gathered around this new cart. And I would like to think, the Bible doesn't say this, and I'm just leaping out of the Scriptures right now, I know, but I would like to have thought that somebody, maybe an old man, would have walked his way through the crowd and said, Listen, there's a Bible that told you how to carry that car. It told you. It told you. You don't carry it in the cart. You carry it with four coins. It said... You don't touch it lest you die. Why didn't any of you read the Bible? David, you meant well, but why didn't you read your Bible? Isn't it amazing that we, it was written down in black and white for those people and they would not even read it. And some of you sitting in here this morning, you come in here and you listen to me preach, but you don't read your Bible to see what it says to you. You're not, you're, you've got your way of doing it. You've got your ideas. You know, there's your way, God's way, and other people's way, and most time you're doing it other people's way. 
Listen to me this morning. There was a Bible. What? We're living in a generation. Now you listen to me. I'm about to close. Those of you who don't like it, leave now. Amen. I go on. I'm, I love you. I'll still love you. But I want to tell you something. You wonder why your marriage is in a mess? You wonder why your home's in a mess? Your family's in a mess? Because you played the game. You kept carrying Jesus Christ on a new cart, and the devil's been pulling your sled, and you think God's going to bless your home and your marriage and your family when you don't obey the word of God? Who are you kidding? You wonder why God has not blessed, but rather smitten your family. New cart. You think you can come into church every Sunday and play games with God and sit there and say, oh, that's good, Reggie, that's a good message, and walk outside that church and not put it into practice in your life and put it in practice in your marriage, put it in practice with your children. God says, when God says discipline your children, you think your children are so sweet they don't need to run? Who do you think you are, God Almighty? You think you can mess around and treat your wife like hash and God bless that? When God says love your wife as Christ loved the church, and you men think God's going to bless your home and you treat her like a hag and an old wash rag? It's too quiet in here. I'm going to tell you something. Listen, God wants to bless you. But God will not violate His book to bless you. What about we some things in the mess? Our marriages, homes, family, our children in rebellion. I'm going to give you something. I said cause and effect. You disobey, curse. You obey, blessing. God said this. Train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. It did not say that if you train him up in the ways of God, he'd rebel, go out and sin, and come back to it. God may allow that in mercy, but that's not what that verse says. You know what that tells me? Not training them up in the ways of God. Because God said, you do it right, I'll bless you. You better go back and check to see if you're doing it like God said. Are you reading with them? Are you living an example in front of them? Are you walking with God in front of them? How is it in your house today? How is it in your life? In your business? Are you honoring God and obeying God? Do you think God's going to bless shady dealings? Do you think God's going to bless a little bit of crookedness in our business dealings? A little bit of lying just to get the deal through? Do you think God's going to honor that? I tell you, God will curse that. You think you can get by lying about something you've done to people you're dumb and you think you can crook and hook and cheat people and do wrong and think God's going to bless? You're kidding yourself. God's going to curse it. God's not going to bless it. We violate financial principles of the Scripture and expect God to bless us. Lazy and expect God to have provision. You know what God said? You don't want work. You don't need. That's the Bible. We got generations of Americans who think that if they don't work, the other taxpayers ought to feed them. We've got a generation of Americans who think the government owes them housing, health care, everything, food, clothing, everything. When all the time God says, they don't owe you nothing. Let me tell you something right now. The United States government doesn't owe me nothing. You hear that? It's a privilege for me to get to live in this country. Amen. I feel better after having said that. I think I got a blessing. Why don't we check the owner's manual? I'm the worst in the world. Get some new something, you know, Christmas or birthday. Well, let's see if I can put it together. I wonder what these nuts and bolts are for. I kind of look like they might go over here. Give me a ranch. Well, I don't know that thing ain't fitting right. I don't know why they make things like this for. I don't think it's right. Here, give me a hammer. Ka-wham, ka-wham, ka-wham. I'll make it fit. I'm going to make this thing fit. Karen comes over and says, Reggie, this, that's supposed to go over here. <laughs> How do you know? Well, I'm reading the instruction. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> We're over here trying to hammer our homes and our lives and our emotions and everything else. God says, bless your enemies. Do good to them to despitefully use you. We wonder why it's not working out. Pray for them that, 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 that abuse you. Love them. Bless them. We, and God says, you do it my way, I'll bless you. You don't do it my way, I'll curse you. We wonder what's wrong. I don't tell you something. Don't think that God is just joking or giving suggestions. He means what he says and he says what he means. And I don't care what them Bible professors say. They make me sick in these colleges. They don't like that. They, they, they make fun of a preacher who says that. Bible says what it means, means what it says. They mock and scoff at it. It attacks the very heart of their distrust of the Scripture. Now I want you to watch real close now. Watch real close what God's going to do right here. You back over in 1 Corinthians 13 with me? God killed Eliza. And now, Bible, verse number 11, look at it. 
And David was what? Sin. Here I was. Watch this. Hey, look up here. Here I was trying to serve God. I came to church three Sundays in a row. God was supposed to bless him. I didn't get that job. God was supposed to bless him. My car tore up. You think God's your slot machine. You don't even know it. And, and so, you know, hey, did you know something? God is absolutely bound by his word to chastise your hide. Every son whom I, he receiveth, he chasteneth. Yea, scourgeth everybody. So we think if we come to church, you know, at least on Sunday morning, if I, you know, I get there, you know, pretty, pretty close to time, Reg's supposed to preach, Reg, you'll, hey, what are you worried about me for? You think you're going to stand for me in judgment? That's a joke. I'll be back over to the back crowd's room one day, man. Listen, get your eyes on God. I mean, God did say don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a matter of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. You think you can violate that and get by and God's going to bless you? Crazy and through bed bugs. David got kicked off. That's what we do. Oh, we had in our head, we're serving God. Well, we're going, we're going to do something. We do it our way, not God's way. We raise our family our way, trying to carry Christ with it all the time, pretending like we're, you know, we're, well, we're Christian. Oh, yes, bless God, we're Christian. Now, I'm telling you, listen to me, God's not messing around. Some of you think you want God's blessing on your life, and you still, still watch that CMT garbage on the, the satellite and all that junk and them, that sexual, sensual, devilish, divorcing garbage. You think God's going to bless your home? You're fixing to get an explosion, bud. David with displeased got ticked off at God. David said, I'm quit. You read your Bible, this is exactly what he did. He said, park that thing. This is what I get for trying to serve God. I'm out of here. Anybody ever done that besides me? I mean, I was trying to serve God, you know, but I was doing it Reggie's way and God cursed it, Jim. And, then, and when God cursed it and it's like the devil said, that's what you get for serving God. You was trying to do it right. Your motives was pure and sincere. And look what God did to you. That's right, devil. I'm on your side now. I'm quitting. When all the time, the only problem was you just trying, you, you, you was just rebellion, open rebellion, disobedience to God's word. You asking God to violate his own holiness for your hide, for your disobedience today, ain't gonna work. But here's the tragedy of it. We're gonna go home. Here's the tragedy. He sends the ark over to a guy named Obed Edom, a Giddy. Oh, this is sweet. Woo, this is sweet now. This, I'm fixing to throw the candy, so watch out. There's a prophetic glory here. Anybody know who Obed-Edom was? He was a Gentile. And it's a prophetic picture that the Jewish people disobeyed God, got bitter at God, set aside the ark, and God said, I'll just let the Gentiles have Christ. And God said that he blessed Obed-Edom's house and all that he had. Now there's a practical glory here. There's going to be folks around you in your life who've gotten bitter at God and don't want the ark. Tell them to park it at your house. You'll take it. Amen. <laughs> and nobody even said it, boys. If you don't want it, I, I, I'll take care of it for you. Bring it over here and set it right down in my living room. Some of you need the ark instead of your television. Hey, the Bible says, read it there. In that passage, it says, God bless Obed Edom and all that he had in his house. You know what the picture is? Here's a daddy. Watch this. We're out of here. Here's a daddy. He says, I want Christ in my home. I want him right in the center of my home. I don't want no put on. I don't want no mirage. I don't want no fake components. I want Jesus Christ in the center of my home. And he is welcome to abide and to dwell in my house. I want to ask you men something. Is Jesus Christ dwelling and abiding in your house? And you say, well, how can I know that? Well, what you're watching, would he watch it with you? What you're listening to, would he listen to it with you? What you're doing, would he do it with you? God has some things to say about our personal lives, our marriages, our families, our children, our relationship. God tell you how to raise kids. God tell you how to have relationships, finances, health. God tell you how to find a mate. God tell you how to dress. God tell you how to conduct yourself. God tell you how to deal in business. God tell you about salvation. God tell you about it all. 
Will we go to the book and say, you know what, before I dive off on this little adventure I want to do for Jesus, I'm going to check the book and see how God says to do it. I wonder how much grief and sorrow we'd save our lives if we would have just read the book. There can be blessing and reward, good reaping, just as well as bad reaping. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings cursing and chastisement. David was bitter at God because God chastised and punished his disobedience to known written will of God. I want to say this in closing. I have disobeyed God's word over the years in my Christian experience. And I could take you to... Listen to me this morning now. God preached this to me before I preached it to you. I can take you to book, chapter, and verse for my violation of God's word cost me. And God did to me exactly what he said he would do to a man who did it. In various areas of my life. I'm glad I serve a God like that that keeps his word. I'm glad. God kept his word. I've experienced chastisement. I've experienced loss. I have experienced pain. I've experienced regret. And I've experienced damage. And I have experienced the damage done to other people through my violation of this book. Bless God, we're not going to violate it and ignore it and get by with it. I thank God that he's kept his word. David, uh, he got over being displeased. He got over being ticked off at God. Got over being aggravated at God. And said, you know what, I'm going to prepare a place for the ark. In verse number 2, then David said, none ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. <laughs> he's got the message now, amen. The Kohathites were the uh, sons of the Levites who were appointed to carry the ark. Now David's back to what? Obeying God. He's back to doing it God's ways. We just got through, Josh read that chapter, or that verse. His ways are not our ways. And what God wants us to do is get back to his ways. He said, none ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites, for them hath the Lord chosen to do what? Carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. You know what he's done? He's had revival in his heart. He's got lined up somewhere between chapter 13 and now he's done what? What's he done? Anybody know? He's repented, but he's done something else. That brought that repentance. He went back and checked the Word of God. He just went back and read his Bible. He went and grazed. He went back and he said, you know what, I'm going to check this thing out. I, something ain't working here. God's not blessing what I'm doing. I'm going to go back. And he read his Bible. And when he read it, he found out that who was supposed to carry it and how they were supposed to carry it. By the way, <clears throat> you remember how they carried four, four men on their shoulders? I... I uh, those four men are represented in the New Testament by who? Does anybody know? Guess. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John carries the gospel to the world. Isn't that something? And uh, anyway, it's a foreshadow of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. David gathered all Israel together to Jerusalem, verse 3, to bring up the ark of the Lord unto his place which he prepared for it. And David assembled the children of Aaron and the Levites. So he gets those. And the sons of who? Kohat, right, okay. So now let's jump down to verse number 12. And he brings all these people out. Verse number 12, he said unto them, You are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. For because you did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us. Now watch this. For that, you ought to underline this. We sought him not after the due order. Mm, mm, mm. We sought him not after the due order. That was the problem. They had sought God, but not after the way God said that he was going to be approached and worshipped. And this is why it's so critical. Because This is why, you know, this universalistic attitude, you know, that, that well, everybody's going to heaven, they're going their own way, and all this kind of stuff, and not according to God's word. Jesus said, I'm the way. There's a way to approach God. We sought not him after the due order. So the priests, the Levites, sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God into Israel. And the children of the Levites bear the ark of God how? upon their shoulders with the stays therein. How? As Moses commanded, according to what? The word of the Lord. Boy, I won't tell you what. There it is. Now I'll tell you the things fixing to happen now. And David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren. To, now he said, watch this. Everything's getting in order now. Now we can have singers. Now we can have the instruments of music. 
the psaltery, the harps, the cymbals, the sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. Now we're lined up with God. Now we have genuine revival, blessed of God. So the Levites appointed Heman, the son of Joel, and his brethren. It goes all the way down through there. And, uh, and they brought the verse number 25. So David and the elders of Israel, the captains over thousands, went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant out of the Lord, uh, of the Lord out of the house of Obed-Edom with joy. And it came to pass when God helped the Levites. Look at there. What happened? What happened? What happened? God started helping them. Amen. You know, God's blessing, God's touch, God's, uh, God's help in the situation. Do it the way God says to do it. And uh, God helped the Levites that bear the ark of the covenant, Lord, that they offered seven bullocks, seven rams. And uh, anyway, why? They, they, verse number 28, Thus all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant. The Lord was shouting with sound of cornet and trumpet, cymbals making noise, hop and harp. And uh, if you've got a situation where things didn't work out so great, you disobeyed the Lord, why, well, just go back to the book and say, you know what, I'm not just going to bail out and quit, God. I'm going to go back and I'm going to do it right. I'm going to do it like the Bible says to do and let God bless my life for it. So I want to encourage you tonight with that.